speakers today uh, for taking the time to um, come out and present and share their knowledge with us. We're really lucky to have them. Uh, first, we'll be hearing from Carl Doss, who's the Director of Access to Legal Services for the Virginia State Bar, and he'll be speaking on the justice gap in Virginia and the importance of doing pro bono work, and hopefully um, some of you will be able to get involved with that later. Um, and then we have jo Joseph Polari and Cynthia Henning from Kids in Need of Defense, um, which is a nonprofit organization that aims to make sure that no children have to go into immigration court alone. and. Uh, Joe is the pro, one of the pro bono coordinating attorneys, and Cynthia is a direct representation attorney, and they'll be presenting um, on um, substantive law for defensive asylum practice. I'd also like to thank all of you for attending uh, the CLE. I really hope that um, you know you get a lot of information out of it, and will come away with a foundation um, for asylum law practice, and also hopefully a desire to take on a pro bono case in the future. <coughs> Um, just want to touch on some logistics quickly, so um, please help yourselves to lunch. Um, the bathrooms are out the back door and to the right hand side. Um, we're going to have a break halfway through for about 10 minutes uh, and um, hopefully that will be helpful because I know it's a tight uh, presentation. Um, Wi-Fi password is on the board, uh, hopefully it is working now. Uh, but please let me know if it's not. Uh, we will be sending out the certification forms for the CLE so that you can submit them to the Virginia State Bar after the CLE, and I'll be sending those all out as an attachment via email uh, after the CLE, so today or tomorrow probably. Uh, along with that email, we will have a link for you to please, please take less than five minutes to fill out a survey on how the CLE was um, how you found the speakers to be, uh, registration, lunch, pretty much everything. We really value your feedback and it takes less than five minutes. It's a super short survey. There will be a link in the email and you can just kind of click through. Very similar to the registration form that we had online. Um, also, I want to point out two forms that you received at registration. One is a list of current uh, cases that are available to take as pro bono cases with kids in need of defense and there's case blasts on, on each of those cases and then the other form is the kind uh, pro bono interest form so if you you know are willing to commit to take on a pro bono case um, either now or you know in the near future please do fill out that form uh, for us so that we can follow up with you after the CLE uh, and make sure that you know we can we can get a case placed with you um, if that's something that you're interested in. And um, we do provide extensive uh, mentorship through KIND attorneys, and that's one of the roles that Joe has at, at KIND. So um, please don't be shy about that. Uh, it, it's a really amazing experience. Um, and you would, like I said, receive extensive mentorship throughout the life of the case. You don't have to have any background in immigration law. Um, and yeah, so I think that covers everything. So I will hand it over to Carl. Great. And thank you, Sasha. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Carl Doss. I'm the Director of Access to Legal Services with the Virginia State Bar. Uh, in that capacity, what I do is I am the coordinator and overseer, so to speak, of the State Bar's initiatives when it comes to legal aid, pro bono, indigent defense, and to a very small extent, self-represented litigants. Um, my presentation is basically very, very general, and obviously you'll be getting more specific information on uh, the representation of undocumented minors, but uh, specifically I'm here to talk about uh, Rule 6.1, pro bono, and what has come to be known as the justice gap. And uh, that's basically what I do to a large degree is I try to make sure that lawyers and the public know about the justice gap, where the needs are, and where the opportunities are. And so uh, this presentation is going to be an abbreviated version of that uh, well, presentation that I do. So there it is. We're going to cover a few things, a lot of it quickly, but uh, the primary topics are what's justice gap, why legal uh, representation makes a difference, why legal aid is not enough, what is pro bono, talking about the rules and the rigs, 
looking specifically at what's going on here in Virginia, and then talking about Virginia free legal answers and other pro bono opportunities, and hopefully there'll be time for questions. So what is the justice gap? Uh, that's a nice quote from Sam and Dash. I won't read it, you can, it's in the material, but uh, basically the justice gap is the difference between the amount of legal resources available generally versus those that are available for people who are low income. And there have been countless studies, but one fact is very, very uh, consistent through all of this, is that 80% of the civil legal needs of the poor in Virginia, in the United States, in any state of the union, go unmet. There are just simply not enough legal resources for poor people. Um, a poll that the Office of the Executive Secretary of the Supreme Court of Virginia did a few years ago, uh, 2007, basically indicated that the public views the way that poor people are treated in Virginia courts as worse or substantially worse than any other demographic group in the state. Worse than women, worse than African Americans, worse than non-English speakers, worse than Latinos. You know, over 50%, almost 60% of, uh, at least according to this poll, 60% of the people who uh, responded to the survey feel that the poor are treated much worse or somewhat worse than any other group. So legal representation doesn't make a difference. Well, we would hope so. We all went to law school, or most of us went to law school, and one would think that because we went to lawyers, folks who have us working for them are going to fare better than folks who are representing themselves. But there's plenty of data to prove this out. If you look at eviction cases, tenants who are represented by counsel fare twice as well, or have more favorable outcomes twice as often as folks who represent themselves. Shouldn't come as a surprise. But then you look at other areas. Social security appeals, unemployment claims, immigration asylum cases, suspension of deportation. Again, the data shows that if the clients, if the litigants are represented by counsel, they're going to fare two to three times better than those who are representing themselves. So as lawyers, one would think this is pretty good news for us of relevance to this particular topic. Uh, minors who are uh, in immigration matters without lawyers face dramatically higher rates of deportation. You can see here that less than 10% of the children who are unrepresented actually have favorable outcomes in, in uh, deportation matters, whereas children with counsel are almost 70% uh, successful. So clearly it makes a huge difference. So the question that comes up to me is, okay, I understand that, Carl, you know, you, you've got these, this data, statistics show that <coughs> kids with lawyers and, and people who are represented by counsel, you know, they fare better, you know, we know that uh, there's an issue with the legal resources for poor people, but we've got legal aid. Well, here's, here's the problem. First of all, when it comes to the issue of access to legal assistance, the World Justice Project did a rule of law study basically in 2012. There's actually a more recent version, but it ranks 97 countries in terms of access to legal assistance. And as you can see here, and hopefully you can see, I'm sorry, the, the lettering is uh, kind of small, but these are all the nations that were surveyed. Here's the U.S. right here. We are 68 out of 97 countries, which is, you know, not real good. Um, who, who, where do we fare compared to some you know, other nations. Well, you know, they're the usual suspects. The ones you would think were probably a little bit better than the U.S. when it comes to access to justice are, are there. I mean, Denmark, Sweden, you know, that's no surprise. Uh, Germany, the U.K., you know, they're, they all are, are better. Italy's there. Eh, you know, you know the, the Korea is there. You know, so, so there are some nations there that, you know, okay, granted, maybe they spend a little bit more. Maybe they have a little bit more in terms of resources for poor people. But let's, let's look at some of the countries that are also better than the U.S. that might come as a bit of surprise. Um, first of all, Iran. They're ahead of us. Romania is ahead of us. 
um, China. Now, on the positive side, we are ahead of uh, the Philippines. We're ahead of uh, Peru. Uh, you know, Nepal is at the very bottom, so you know they've got a ways to go. But clearly, we are not where one would think we ought to be when it comes to access to justice. And part of the reason why is because per, uh, government per capita spending on civil legal services for the poor is very, very poor here. As you can see in the U.S. compared to, again, countries that, that we would expect, you know, that we compare ourselves to, we spend far less in assisting the poor when it comes to civil representation. You see 225 per capita versus $26 in uh, the U.K., 970 in the Netherlands, $4 in 86 cents in Germany, $4.50 in France, we do not basically spend the resources to provide civil legal assistance to the poor. Why is that? Well, first of all, <coughs> most of the legal aid offices are funded through the Legal Services Corporation. And as you can see here, the two lines, one is uh, the LSC appropriations, it, it, the blue line, represents annual LSC appropriations to legal aid offices. Uh, and then uh, the red line takes that same number and puts it in 2012 dollars. And basically while the blue line, the actual funding, is more or less flat, in real dollars you can see that the funding for legal aid has significantly dropped since 1975. An additional source for uh, revenue for legal aid office is IOLTA, the interest on lawyer to trust accounts. And here in Virginia, used to be roughly half a million dollars a month. But you can see this is going back to 2006, but by the time we get to June of 2012, it's less than $50,000 a month. So it has been a huge drop. What has been the impact of this? <coughs> well, basically, there's been a 20% cut in overall funding for Virginia's legal aid offices. The result of this is that legal aid offices have lost 61 positions total out of 318, that's staff positions. 34 of those positions are lawyer positions. That's about 21% of the total legal staff. So what does that mean for the state as a whole? What it means is this, is that there are just 130 legal aid lawyers covering Virginia. That's 130 lawyers covering almost 43,000 square miles. Let me just give you an example. Rappahannock Legal Services has five attorneys covering 17 counties. Legal Aid Society of Southwest Virginia, Southwest uh, Virginia Legal Aid Society, has seven attorneys covering a land area the size of New Jersey. The crisis in legal aid is very real. Moreover, during the same period that these cuts are going on, the poverty population, according to the U.S. Census, has increased by 32%. So more people need the services of legal aid, and there's fewer lawyers to provide the assistance. So legal aid, clearly, is not the answer. They can't meet that need. So where does that leave us? Well, pro bono. Pro bono is, unfortunately, the next option. And I say that, unfortunately, because it, it's something that, that lawyers do on their own. You're not getting paid for pro bono. You're doing it because, for well, one, the rules say you ought to be doing it, but also because hopefully your conscience is pricked, you see that there's a need, and you want to do something about it. So let's talk about the other rule. The rule in Virginia is 6.1, voluntary pro bono service. It says that a lawyer should render at least 2% per year of their professional time to pro bono publico legal services. And that includes poverty law, it includes civil rights law, it includes public interest law, and it includes voluntary activities designed to increase the availability of pro bono legal services. But the rule is also great because it offers a few options. One is that groups of lawyers can basically pool their pro bono obligations and deal with it collectively. And it also provides for direct financial support, or what I like to call checkbook pro bono. So if you don't have the time to take on a case or do, you know, actual case representation, 
you can cut a check and aid a legal aid program or other uh, nonprofit legal services organization that provides pro bono and still meet your obligation. Let's delve a little bit deeper into the rule. Now, one thing is that uh, we don't have mandatory pro bono. I guess that kind of is contrary to the intent. Pro bono is supposed to be voluntary, not mandatory. But the comment to Rule 6.1 says that every lawyer, regardless of their professional prominence or workload, has a personal responsibility to do some sort of pro bono work. So while it is not mandatory, if you are a lawyer, if you've got this law license, if you've got, you know, you've got a job, you should be doing some sort of pro bono service. And as I mentioned before, there's four broad categories of pro bono service. Poverty law, civil rights law, public interest law, voluntary activities designed to increase the availability of pro bono legal services. So what is poverty law? Basically, it is providing free or nominal fee legal assistance to someone who cannot afford to compensate a lawyer. Okay? Um, the uh, comment number two gives an example. Attorneys participating in legal aid referral programs is a type of poverty law. Basically, a couple things that, that, that you need to uh, be aware of up front is that in terms of what constitutes, you know, a person who is unable to compensate a lawyer, there is no real definition or threshold requirement set. It's kind of in the eye of the beholder. But, you know, you can use the legal aid guideline, which is usually 125% of the federal poverty line, or you can just make that on, you make the determination on your own. You, the client comes in and says, hey, I can't pay you. You do a brief, you know, type of resource analysis. They don't have, you know, they have a real low paying job, they're modest means, whatever. If you represent them for free, if you represent them for even a nominal fee, that is pro bono for the purposes of the rule. One key uh, consideration is that the representation, the pro bono representation has to be established up front. It is not one of those things that, you know, after the end of the representation, the guy says, uh, you know, hey, I can't pay you, I'm sorry, and you say, fine, I'll write it off, that'll be my pro bono. Uh-uh, that's not pro bono under the rule. The rule says that pro bono needs to be established up front. <coughs> Civil rights law is another type of uh, pro bono service. And again, it's free or nominal fee, legal services to protect the rights of an individual in which society has an interest. It could be, you know, uh, race, gender, uh, you know, age, uh, disability, all sorts of, of, of uh, professional services in the assistance of victims of discrimination is a type of pro bono, again, provided that it's free or nominal fee and that that uh, relationship is established up front. Public interest law is a third category, broad category of pro bono legal assistance. Again, free or nominal fee representation to religious charitable groups. Um, and an example given here is working with, uh, work providing legal representation, not working for a homeless shelter, or operating a hotline for battered spouses. Providing that type of legal assistance in those matters would be pro bono publico under Rule 6.1. I have my own note there is that the examples seem to point towards work with vulnerable populations. So I'm not getting political or anything like that, but I would suggest, I would submit to you that let's say you decide that you want to provide free legal service to the National Rifle Association. Okay, I understand that, you know, that, that is a, a public interest organization. The issue is, are they really an organization that needs free legal assistance? I would submit to you no, as opposed to a uh, homeless shelter or battered spouse hotline, which probably does not have the resources to retain counsel. The final category, broad category of 6.1 pro bono legal service is voluntary activities designed to increase the availability of pro bono legal services. Now, um, this is a very, very broad category. The way I like to look at it is this. The other three categories are actual representation. This is non-representation pro bono. 
basically, um, let's say you're a government lawyer and you've got, you're precluded from doing, you know, actually representing a client in a case. Um, or you know, maybe by virtue of your employment otherwise, you're precluded from taking on an actual client. Well, one way that you can still do pro bono is to do this fourth category of pro bono, the, the, the non-representational pro bono. And what I mean by that is this. Um, you put on a CLE for legal aid lawyers or pro bono lawyers. That's pro bono because you're allowing them to provide representation to somebody who cannot afford to retain counsel. Great way to do it. Or you serve on the board of directors for your local legal services organization. That's another way of doing pro bono. You're not actually representing a client, but by virtue of serving on the board, your service is allowing them to represent people who cannot afford counsel. Those are great ways of doing pro bono without actually representing a client. Contingent fees. The rule talks about contingent fees. You've seen the commercials, you've heard the commercials. I don't get paid unless you get paid. And the question comes up, is that pro bono? The rule is very, very clear. The answer is no. And the reason why is for the reason that I set forth earlier. Basically, the relationship that you don't get paid is set up in advance of the representation. So, you know, whether or not the litigation is ultimately successful or unsuccessful doesn't matter. If the client gets paid, you still don't get paid if you're doing it on pro bono. <coughs> I mentioned earlier the collective works. Basically, as I said before, a law firm, a law office, a group of lawyers can pool their pro bono obligation. And typically what happens in some of the larger firms is that the new associate gets the pro bono obligation. It happens that way. It's fine. The rule says no problem. That's cool. You know, as long as basically the obligation is met. And direct financial support, as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you don't have the time, but you want to help, you want to do some pro bono, checkbook pro bono or direct financial support is a great way to do it. You know, legal aid offices conduct fundraisers, they send out envelopes each year, sometimes several times a year, asking for contributions. If you contribute to legal aid, if you contribute to a nonprofit <coughs> pro bono provider, that is a way of satisfying the obligation under Rule 6.1. I would note that com uh, Common 10 says that uh, if you opt to do pro bono in this way, that uh, you know the rule suggests that the contribution should be in proportion to your professional income. I would interpret that to mean basically if 2% of your professional time as a lawyer should be devoted to pro bono public service, 2% of your professional income as a lawyer should be likewise devoted to pro bono. So what's going on in Virginia? Basically, this is uh, the federal guidelines here. Um, roughly, it's less than $12,000 for a one-person household. Um, you know, and it goes up from there, basically forty-one sixty for each person in addition to the household uh, raises the guideline. In Virginia, in terms of how we fare compared to other states, our neighbors, and nationally, our poverty rate is fairly low. I mean, you know, we're below the national average. Uh, we're less, we have a poverty rate lower than both North Carolina and Tennessee. Um, but you can see we are well uh, above New Hampshire, which is a leading state. Uh, we are above Maryland, you know, which is the orange line there. So better than some, not as good as others. Regionally in Virginia, it should come as no surprise, the poverty rate is highest in South Side and Southwest Virginia. Uh, Eastern Virginia is actually fairly high. Uh, Northern Virginia is low, um, relatively speaking. Uh, Central Virginia is also fairly low. But as you can see, in terms of our overall uh, regionally, um, you know, 
South Side and Southwest Virginia are areas of great, great need. Overall, more than one million people in Virginia are living in poverty. 800,000 are below the poverty line. Another 200,000 have incomes that are less than 125% of the federal poverty line, uh, poverty guidelines, which I mentioned earlier is a threshold for most legal aid offices. Roughly one in eight Virginians is eligible for free legal services from a legal aid program. But as I said before, there's only 130 legal aid lawyers, so there's a problem. 48% of the low and moderate income households in Virginia experience a legal problem each year. That's approximately 400,000 legal problems annually. So is pro bono filling the breach? Well, these are the statistics, the data from uh, Virginia legal aid programs. Uh, in 2013-14, they closed uh, roughly 29,000 cases. The private bar handled about 9% of those and contributed 19,000 hours. Um, it says about less than 70,000 low-income Virginians receive some sort of uh, assistance through legal aid. But the problem is, is that number is lower than what it was the previous year. And these are statistics from 2012, 2013. 35,000 cases were closed by legal aid offices in, uh, during that period. 30,000 handled by legal aid. The private bar handled 3,500 of those cases, or about 10% of those. And then uh, less than 1,000 were handled by uh, private attorneys who get paid through judicare. So the situation is getting worse. Basically, this just breaks down regionally where legal aid is, you know, I mean, where pro bono is being done. Um, you can see that in terms of where pro bono is, the activity is the greatest. Northern Virginia, Central Virginia are great, um, or are, are better than other regions. Unfortunately, I won't say great, but are, are better than other regions. Um, the uh, Valley region is also has a, a very uh, uh, respectable level of pro bono service. However, one of the problems here is that in Virginia, we don't monitor or track pro bono activity. Legal aid offices are required to do that. Some of the nonprofit legal services organizations or pro bono organizations track it. Some don't do a very good job of tracking it. And there is no reporting requirement for private attorneys. So in terms of the actual hours that are being reported that we're able to, 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 to estimate, it is just that. It is an estimation. We know what legal aid does. We know we have a reasonable idea of what's going on through the nonprofit pro bono organizations. And we go to data from the ABA and extrapolate from that in terms of what's happening on an ad hoc basis. When I say ad hoc pro bono, what I'm talking about is basically, you know, when an attorney gets a cold call, somebody comes in and says, this is my situation, can you help me, you know, and the attorney says, yes, all well and good, we just can't track it. But in any event, with all those numbers, with the numbers we have, with the extrapolation, from the legal aid survey, I mean, with the uh, from the ABA survey, basically we're coming up with Virginia attorneys providing about 80,000 hours of pro bono. So that sounds all right. Well, no, because if we were in compliance with Rule 6.1, we would have donated, should have donated more than 900,000 hours of pro bono. We're not even meeting 10% of the obligation that's set forth in 6.1. As I said before, we really don't know what's going on outside of legal aid, so we extrapolate from the report. There is, I will let you know, a movement to perhaps add a pro bono reporting requirement here in Virginia. It is in the early stages, but we're hoping that that we, and I will say, we are hoping that that happens because Number one, once we get a better feel for those hours, it will allow both legal aid and the various nonprofit legal services organizations to better allocate their resources in terms of meeting the needs of the poor. Plus, we can be more strategic in terms of our pro bono activity. So even if, let's say that, you know, with the ad hoc activity, let's say that the ABA survey is totally wrong. It's just wrong. Got to be more than that. I will bet my next paycheck that there is not 850,000 hours 
of ad hoc pro bono being done by Virginia lawyers. I will bet my paycheck on that because it, it's just no way. It is no way. Every reasonable estimation would show that we are nowhere close to meeting that 900,000 hour goal. So why aren't attorneys doing more pro bono? <laughs> the ADA survey that I mentioned uh, basically listed the top seven reasons, time constraints, family obligations, lack of skills or practice experience in the area where pro bono is needed, competing billable hours, financial burden on the practice, lack of administrative support, lack of malpractice insurance, all valid. Not saying any of those are bad reasons. And the ABA survey offers strategies to increase pro, uh, pro bono participation. I won't go into detail about that, but basically it has a number of ways that the bar, that the Access to Justice Commission, that a number of pro bono providers and stakeholders can things that we should be doing to increase pro bono activity. And some of these things are being done. And that's more. And again, more. So, I've set forth kind of a bad scene for the bad situation. I, you know, I, I wish I wish I had some good news on that front. I don't. However, I do have what I think are some intriguing opportunities and ways that we can move the ball when it comes to pro bono. One of which is something that you may have heard <coughs> about or read about in recent months that the bar is uh, involved in. Basically, we are going to be uh, hosting a portal. We are one of uh, 40 states that will be participating in the ABA's freelegalanswers.org program. Our, our uh, site will be virginia.freelegalanswers.org. And the bottom line is this, it is a really a website where People, users who meet the financial eligibility requirements will be able to pose a question on the website, a civil legal question on the website. Attorneys will register for the service. They can go in at their convenience, look at the questions that are listed on the queue, pull a question that meets their interest, their competence, their comfort, their legal experience, take that question, answer it, post it on the website. The person who uses, uh, the person who poses the question, can they go to the website, pull the question down, get the answer to the question. End of representation. It's nothing further. It is the most basic form of pro bono that I can conceive of. It's a great opportunity to increase the numbers. As the slide here says, there are 40 states, including Virginia, that have signed up to be part of this project. Additionally, I will note that one Canadian province has also signed up to be part of it. So we're, it's international. It's a great opportunity. This website will be uh, basically commenced in August. August 9th is tentatively the kickoff date. In fact, at about 3.30, I've got to go on a phone call about this to see where things are going. But it is a great opportunity for low-income Virginians and modest means Virginians to get answers to legal questions. Every day, every day I get a phone call, at least one call, from somebody who just wants to know, do I have a case? Unfortunately, because of my position, I can't answer that question. I, you know, this will be a way for them to pose that question. They can lay out the facts. Do I have a case? Attorney can weigh in, answer the question. The person can then decide how they wish to move forward. Another question that comes up, who's paying for all this? And, and primarily of interest to Virginia lawyers is, is this going to raise my bar dues? And the answer to that question is no. The ABA is doing all the fundraising on this. They're doing all the fundraising. It's basically, the, the fundraising goes to two things. One. Uh, for the actual technical maintenance of the uh, website, including uh, an administrator, and also for the malpractice insurance. Because if you answer questions on this website, you will be covered. Now, if you take your business off the website, that's on you. But as long as you're answering a question on the website, you will be covered under the malpractice insurance policy of the National Legal Aid Defenders Association. 
and as I said before, no increase in your dues. Tennessee was the first state. They launched their interactive pro bono website roughly six years ago, and since then, 11,000 clients have been served and over 500 lawyers have signed up. Other states followed, and basically last year, both the Virginia Supreme Court Access to Justice Commission and the State Bar Special Committee on Access to Legal Services both recommended that Virginia get involved. It's not a substitute for free or for full representation, but as I said before, basically the great thing about the service, 365 days per year, 24 hour access to the website for low income Virginians who basically need answers to their legal questions. How can they access them? Basically they can access it anywhere that they can establish a Wi-Fi connection. So they can access it through their smartphones, they can go to the public library. And you know, the question came up actually, smartphones, does everybody have, is, is smartphone usage that prevalent in society? Actually it is. Statistics show that right now over 80 to 85% of the public, regardless of income, have access to smartphones. The smartphone is for some people, their landline, their computer and everything else. So actually this is a good way, not perfect, but it's a good way to at least make legal assistance accessible. The bar recruits, you know, we'll work with the administrator, we'll promote the website, we'll confirm that the lawyers are in good standing, you know, we'll make sure that the questions actually involve legal issues. If they don't, we'll direct the user to the appropriate resource. And those users who do not qualify financially, we'll help them find other resources. We'll direct them maybe to the lawyer referral service or some other uh, legal assistance provider. Um, it's limited scope for representation. It is as limited scope as one can provide and it's just civil. The threshold is 250% of the federal guidelines. So if we're talking about a household income for a single adult of just over $29,000, which will make it accessible. And, and here's more information about how the website works. I'm going to go actually I'll pass over this. You can see it in your notes. But as I said before, it is a process in which the user will post a question, the lawyer will pull the question out of the queue, the queue will organize the questions by legal issue. So you know you won't have to hunt hard. You can see if it's landlord tenant or uh, uh, divorce or custody or uh, creditor issues, you can pull out the question, look at the question, preview the question, and if you don't want the, you don't like the question, put it back. If you like the question, pull it down. Nobody else will touch it. And your communication with the individual user is anonymous. It is basically you and the and the uh, user. No one else can look at the question. No one else can see what you answered. And in terms of your communication with the uh, user, you'll know who the user is, the person who posted the question. They'll see only that you are a volunteer lawyer. They will not know your name unless you disclose it. <coughs> this is what the website will look like. This is uh, actually the homepage for the ADA. That's Tennessee's page. That's how the questions, the page where the questions will be asked. Uh, Basically, amongst the pertinent information, the court date or legal deadline, you also, uh, the person will indicate who the other party is, so you'll know whether they're a person or an organization, and the name of the person, so you can do your conflict check. This is uh, basically how the queue will look, so you can see the type of problem and the subject and who the opposing party is and when it was submitted. That's the question, as I said before, once you as an attorney answers a question, you post it on the website, representation is done, the communication is closed. And there's a closed, as you see there's a check mark there, say the question is marked as answered and now closed. But you can continue before you close it, if you need further clarification from the user, <coughs> you can request that. Basically, the agreement, how the website works, the user agreement, the agreement for lawyers. Basically, it, it clearly sets forth what the relationship is for both the user and for. This is a list of other resources that are available in case you know they need 
further representation or, again, don't qualify. Conflicts of interest, because you will know the name of the user, the person who submits the question, as well as the opposing party and the court date, you can do your conflict check. Lawyers should not use this service to solicit potential clients. So what's the benefit? Convenience. Lawyers can do pro bono anytime, day or night, anywhere, at home, work, bookstore, Starbucks, wherever. They can do it, you know, while the kids are playing soccer, roll in the action, check three legal answers. Time, basically the amount of time, the commitment by the lawyer in terms of time is relatively small. Control, you have absolute control over which questions you answer, whether you answer the question, and the extent of the dialogue with the uh, person who posed the question. It's a great way for government and corporate lawyers who might be precluded from taking on full case representation to get involved. Lawyers who are on medical leave can continue by answering free legal, uh, by answering questions off of uh, virginiafreelegalanswers.org. And as I said before, malpractice is provided. And what's very cool about this because the questions come up, well, doesn't this actually decrease pro bono attorney representation? No. The great thing about it is that the states who have done this have found that pro bono activity by their attorneys have increased because attorneys, this is their way of sticking their toe in the water for pro bono and finding out that the water is actually warm and it's good and the swimming is fine and they want to get deeper involved. This is the flyer, the brochure for uh, free legal answers. As I said, it's free, it's limited scope, it's convenient, and it's anonymous, and it is a way for you to do pro bono. Um, at the end of your material, there are a bunch of other options for pro bono opportunities. I'll let you uh, discover them on your own, but I will conclude by basically uh, two notes. First of all, that if you are interested in pro bono, and I know that this is about you know the representation of undocumented youth. The State Bar has been involved with that. We put on. Uh, with the Legal Aid Justice Center, uh, special immigrant juvenile uh, status trainings for lawyers to handle the family court side of the representation. And the response by the Virginia private bar has been outstanding. But there's other opportunities. If you are interested in doing other types of pro bono, in addition to that, please contact me. I will be your matchmaker. I will help you find the right pro bono opportunity for you. We're building resources, we're finding out what's out there, you know, so contact me. My phone number, my email address are in the materials. I'll end on this note. As I said before, we are well short of that 900,000 hour goal that we should be at under the rule. However, by just doing a little bit more, we can make a huge difference. Two hours per week by an attorney would make a huge difference. Two hours, frankly, two hours per month will make a huge difference. We'll double the amount of hours that we're tra presently tracking. Free legal answers is a great way to do it, but there's other opportunities. Let me basically help you find the right pro bono opportunity. So with that, I'll step down. I thank you for your time and attention. Oh, and I did want to say one last thing because I forgot to acknowledge it. In the back, Giovanni, I want to congratulate him. Yeah, yeah, you get, you've earned it. Uh, the Edwin Burnett Young Lawyer of the Year by the Virginia State Bar. Great, great. Congratulations, Giovanni, Sasha Giovanni. Thank you for having me.